in there because I related to songs that you could feel that somebody had gone through something that motivated them to tell their story as opposed to that it was just churned out by rhyming some words and, 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 you know, and, and making stuff up. That's to me was the, that was the beacon for me. If it rang my bell, I would present it to the record label and let them say, okay, run with that one. I like the way that sounds. I have to lighten it up for a minute. You crack me up. <laughs> I mean, there are some things that I read about you that were amusing. One of them is, and I don't even believe you, said the, the, the Little River Band is not your favorite band. Give me a break. <laughs> I think that's so cute. Who is? Earth, Wind, and Fire. Oh, my uh, baby, and, you and I are like born in the same mold. <laughs> I love them, yes, next to well, you. The, and and they, they, like I say, they epitomize R&B, vocals, horns, songs, spirit, um, and I, and I truly mean spirit of, you know, the, the essence of their music is, uh, uh, it, it's spiritual. And, and they still put that across to this day. They're, they're having fun and they're doing what they're doing, but they're doing it because this inner spirit that just, it just resonates with me. Um, if I could, I don't know how to encapsulate this in, in a short time, but to take the heritage of Little River Band and the history of Little River Band and the spirituality of what the songs mean to people and to start giving back, that's what's been going on for the last few years. We're finding avenues where we can do fundraisers and donate our time, donate our music and, and, and whatever to draw people in to make them aware of situations and circumstances for the military, for cancer survivors, for uh, homeless, for... Um, dog rescues and pet, you know, animal rights and so on and so forth. Those things are all so rewarding. And the spirit of where Earth, Wind and Fire comes from to me is it's printed inside me somewhere. It's part of what I feel when we take the stage. We're having a ball and we're having a ball expressing ourselves every night w with, with this music. And like I say, the, the, the ability to give back and to help people get their charities and their nonprofits and stuff organized and up and running and stuff like that is just extremely rewarding to to us, all of us. Right, and I should say that on 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 this newest album, one of the songs, which one is it? It's uh, "Lost and Lo the Lost and the Lonely." It's dedicated to the Green Berets and um, in honor of our fallen soldiers, and all I guess proceeds from that go to charity. All the proceeds for the whole year are going to – it's it's now the, – the, the guy that started the Green Beret Foundation has moved on to something called Mission America. And in 25 words or less, when people transition out of the military, a lot of times they are given 30 days' notice to get their entire life together, insurance, housing, education, um, uh, occupation, uh, everything, everything in 30 days. You can imagine uprooting somebody with two kids and whatever from their their place, and suddenly they have to go and do that. It's an amazing thing. Mission America is helping give them resources to go do that. That's just one of the things that they do. But um, little known fact, we send those people over there to put their lives on the line so we can do what we do in our free country. And then when they come back, we basically just kick them to the curb a lot of times. We kick them to the curb, and that's disgusting and has to change. And until it does, we're going to try to help bridge the gap. But every download all year long for the lost and the lonely, at the end of the year, we will write a check. Every bit of what Little River Band would have made from that from that song will go to Mission America. I love it. I love it. The music industry, real quick, today. Hmm. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? In the, in, in, in just quickly. Massive change, obviously. Um uh, massive change to the uh, to to the vehicle. Um, you still got to you still got to write a song. You still got to deliver a song that that engages people and draws them in. Now it's um, you know streaming and and downloading and so on and so forth. Can you take one? You don't take a CD, so on and so forth. It's it's a it's a very different world, of course, to to what to to the music industry we grew up in. I still think there's incredible talent. There's still incredible songwriting. There's great talent out there. It's how it gets into people's ears that is massively different. And I will say that there are still people out there that are ripping musicians off right and left, making a fortune, hit and run uh, with, with their websites and their services and their so on and so forth. Um, so 
in one sense, it's massively different. And in the other sense, there's still a bunch of greed, you know, wound into the process. And uh, you got to watch everything you do. Um, but I still think the, the essentials are the same. You got to deliver a song that engages people, and then you got to find a way to get a lot of people to hear it. That's it, and it's tough these days. Your favorite band, one of your favorite bands, the Beatles, so influenced you. Here's a lyric: Will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? Hey, buddy, you're 64 years old, and yeah, you're touring. Uh, it, it suddenly became my ringtone, my <laughs> ring back tone about three months ago. People are saying, "Uh, you got a birthday coming up, or what?" <laughs> A hundred shows a year, you're still doing though, right? I remember cutting school. I lived three blocks from the high school. I cut school and ran at lunchtime because uh, Sergeant Peppers was out and I had one. And we went home and we put it on and, and two of my musician friends and I, we just sat glued to the to the hi-fi, played it about 10 times. And here it is. I'm there. I'm 64. It's crazy. but um, And looking uh, damn good, I might say. Ever too old to play rock and roll music? Uh, from the neck up, no, I'm still 29 from the neck up. I, <laughs> here's to play. Here's the difference. I, I, I said I would stop when my voice would not deliver Little River Band songs to the quality that, that I wanted them to have. So far, knock on wood, that hasn't happened. But um, I've seen other bands do it, and I don't see any reason why I couldn't play bass for Little River Band and be one of the one of the singers for the band uh, for a whole lot more years, so uh, it it ain't over yet. Well, that's our good our good uh, luck. Uh, your voice, I think, only gets better. By the way, I don't think it's. I I just think it gets richer. You are very kind. Thank you. Honest, never kind, just honest. We talked about your song, "Who Made the Moon." I'm I'm going to read a lyric from that. It says, "Who paints the sky? Who hangs the stars and turns them on each night? How can I fill this empty room? Why'd she have to leave so soon?" God who made the moon. Hey, Wayne, think you'll ever be able to fill the empty room? Nope. Uh, that's her room, and that will that room will always be empty for me. Uh, there are a lot other rooms that are full to overflowing, and uh, the balance is is a life. But no, her her room her room is is will always be empty at thirteen years eleven months. I've been speaking with Wayne Nelson bass player and lead vocalist for Little River Band. For more information on the band and tour dates, visit littleriverband.com and be sure to visit their vital Facebook page listed under, what else? Little River Band. Before I go, I want to remind everyone that podcasts of current and past shows are always available to listen to free on iTunes under The Hallie Caster Jane Show. The Hallie Caster Jane Show is also available for download via Spreaker.com, Stitcher.com, BlogTalkRadio.com, and a host of other venues. Google The Hallie Caster Jane Show, and you will find us. Of course, podcasts of our shows, both past and present, are always posted for your listening pleasure at HallieCasterJane.com which I hope you'll visit often for the latest information on our upcoming segments. I'll be back next week, same time, 3 p.m. Eastern, for another edition of the Hallie Caster Jane Show, Talk Radio for Fine Minds, brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download at www.audibletrial.com forward slash the Hallie Caster Jane Show. Audible.com features over 100,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Stay in touch, won't you? Remember, that's HallieCasterJane.com. Discover us on Facebook at Hallie Caster Jane and on Twitter at Hallie CJ. I love to hear from you. So, till we meet again, this is Hallie Caster Jane. It's... Hi, I'm Gil Fulbright. The people who run my campaign, they've made this commercial, and I'm in it. This campaign, it's not about me. It's about crafting a version of me that'll appeal to you. A version that visits random work sites with paid actors pointing at things. A version of me that doesn't find old people loathsome or pointless. Has a conventionally attractive yet curiously still family. Listening to my constituents, legislating, these are things I don't do. What I do is spend about 70% of my time raising funds for re-election. I'd do anything to stay in office. My name's Gil Fulbright, but 
Hell, I'll change my name to Phil Goldbright or Bill Fulbright or fill up my mouth with farts. These are the things that are important to me. And these are the fine people that finance my campaign. Now, in order to do these things, I have to stay in office. And to stay in office, I have to keep these guys happy. Now, if any of these things make these guys unhappy, well, my hands are tied. So come November, the choice is clear. Do you want another spineless mouthpiece for special interest and lobbyists? Or a spineless mouthpiece for special interest and lobbyists? I'm Philip a mouth with farts, and I approve this message. Greetings. Welcome to HTLA Radio 1 New York, New York's best talk. Enjoy our automated system. Stand by for our automated podcast delivery system to engage. Today's episode of Coffee and Cigarettes, Wednesday Grinder, will begin momentarily. Please insert coin to listen. <laughs> oh, man, is are, are you kidding? Yes, we're, we're replacing Jenny McCartney. Yes, we are. We're, we're getting rid of her. We're putting on the automated podcast system. Yes. Insert coin. <laughs> oh, you know, you got to love it. Hey, how you doing, world? Welcome to HDLA Radio 1, New York's best talk. It's your coffee and cigarettes, your Wednesday grinder for Wednesday the 27th of May, 2015. 301 p.m. right now at HTLA Studio 2 and uh, 82 degrees Central Park right now. Sun's beating down. It's a great day out there. As it most often is these days, and I'm stuck in here. But that's okay. Hey, it's it's my job, right? I, I gotta do my damn job. Right. Also doing the job with me today is, as mentioned, the one and only Jenny McCartney on the buttons, pushing them, making the show go today on that PreSonus 2442 digital broadcast mixer. And hey, if you're into any kind of professional grade audio or digital audio, you'll want to check out PreSonus.com. <clears throat> so today on The Grinder, what do we got? Well, we got Obama news. Yes, yes. Obama team ramps up water regulations. Hey, there you go. Also, the new Hillary news, too. Yes, a judge orders the monthly release of Clinton emails. Yay, now we can subscribe to the magazine, yes. Also today, the Middle East envoy, Tony Blair, resigns as Penn State boots a frat for three years for sexual harassment posting nude photos on Facebook. And they still have not sent me that link. Well, finally today... Uh, what do we got here? Looking for your son to be the next Joe Montana? Well, hey, you're likely going to be screwed. That's right. Man choir. Yes, it's more fun than football. Also today, the monks won't leave the ancient monastery in Syria as ISIL and ISIS threatens getting closer there. Ramping up their efforts in the Middle East. Yes, all that and so much more today on the big show. So, hey, come on in and grab a cup, have a seat and light one up. It is coffee time. Good afternoon and welcome to the show, Coffee and Cigarettes, and on HTLA Radio 1, New York's best talk, of course. Yes, thank you. As mentioned a moment ago, 82 degrees in Central Park right now, beautiful sunny day, all kinds of people, dogs, video cameras, still cameras, models, everything you can think of is out of the park today. My God. And we're missing it all, Jenny. Yes, we are, just for this show. And what about this show? Well, hey, it's a good show. We've got the Obama news going on, the Hillary news, the ISIS, the ISIL. We, we've got everything you could possibly want without a prescription. we got it all right here for you right now. But I would be remiss if I didn't introduce my guest slash co-hosts because, you know, after all, hey, let's be fair. They, they're really the show here. I'm The host kind of doesn't count, I, I don't think. Anyway. But anywho, uh, coming to us live from Mill Bay Studios, as always, in beautiful Mill Bay, British Columbia, Canada, 
It's the one, the only Louis Lawless, director extraordinaire of film and television for the last 35 years in Hollywood, settling down to retire and make documentaries. Uh, Louis, are you there, sir? Uh, we, we're five steps away from winning the Academy Award. Right. And we didn't. Uh, well, no, but but that's okay. Uh, you know, it's. It, I mean, you just you, you're still good. Damn it! Oh, can we cuss? Can I cuss as I always do on on the show? <laughs> 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 well, you know what? You you can. I'll I'll allow it. Just this uh, one hundred and fifty thousand times. Uh, about time. Move on. Move on. You see that? See what I did there, Louis? We we've got the 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 beep. Yeah. And I got lost. H T L A. Right. Oh, H T L A. Hell is that? Well, that that's okay. You'll figure it out. Don't worry. <laughs> it'll it'll come. It'll come. Also joining us today from about eight blocks down the street here in downtown Manhattan is the one, the only Gilbert Gottfried, who is, uh, well, he's he's kind of uh, what's the word today? He's 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 a he's a special kind of something. No, that's not the the words I'm, I'm going to use today. He, he's in an a, a, he's he's in a very interesting mood. I'm going to say that. That's that's what I'm going to say. Gilbert Gottfried is most definitely in an interesting mood today. And of course, uh, now he your your wife her name is Dara, correct? Not not yes. yeah, not Dana, right? Yes. <laughs> I didn't mean to get you in trouble there that man. <laughs> oh, that that was just no good. That was just no good. I'm I'm sorry. You know, you have to kind of cut me some slack sometimes because well, there's just times when you have to. Yes. Yeah, and and this of course is one of those times. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little, I don't know if you've, uh, <clears throat> if you actually noticed this today or not, uh, Gilbert, yes. but, uh, I'm a little discombobulated, uh, lots of stuff going on today, of course, uh, well, no, I mean, not just in Central Park, you know, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's other stuff going on too, but also I do need to introduce our, our, our main man, <laughs> yes, our, well, I guess our main woe man, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, there he is, the one, the only George Takei, or Takai, or ah, screw it, I'm just calling him Sulu. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm George Takei, and uh, when I'm walking down the street, people shout out, Hey, hey Sulu. Sulu, yeah. So I'm no more as Sulu right. than as George Takei, which is what I really am. E- exactly, yeah, and, and uh, um, wait a minute, uh, <laughs> Are, are you? Uh, I, I have to ask this, George. Uh, are are you really you? Or are you? <laughs> is that? Uh, <laughs> uh yeah, yeah. Sorry, there, there's six million things going on, and uh, they 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 don't pay me enough. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> I'm just gonna. I'm just going to go with that today. But uh, welcome to the show, of course, George and uh, Gilbert and Louis, of course, all of you. It's uh, it's great to have you here. God, could I sound like more of a suck? God. <laughs> <laughs> and, and no, you know, contrary to, to popular belief, you know, I'm not just sitting here touching myself watching Jenny play with her. <laughs> I, I do actually work for a living. Yes. Yeah, I do. I do. I remember uh, being on your radio show in Chicago. Uh, yeah. 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 And, and I remember we, we hung out afterwards and had a wild time. Uh, you, you could call it that, yeah. And I remember, too, when we were in the alleyway, pants uh, zipped up, Um, there was this one, you know, sleazy looking guy who walked by right who was staring at us and you turned around and i mean he was a what what what's your problem and you said like you don't give a shit (laughs) (laughs) uh yes the the good old days now um yes 
Uh, now, we, we, we have been doing, for, for the last, uh, oh, I don't know, God, three horrifying months, we've been... Uh, <laughs> We, we've been doing Gilbert with you. Yes. Uh, we've been doing the, the the problem child song. You, you've been doing that for yes. promoting the the new film. Uh, well, I, I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, they've uh, they, they've ceased production. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They ceased production. So, uh, what we thought we would do uh, in in kind of a replacement for your little piece there, because you, you like to do a bit, you know, yes. uh, is is we we get you to do some jokes, and uh, I'll I'll just turn the floor over to you. You can kind of unload and see how that goes. A drunken farmer stumbles upstairs into his bedroom, waking his wife Roseanne. She sits up and sees her husband holding a sheep under his arm. The farmer yells, this is the pig I've been f***ing. <laughs> Roseanne says, you idiot, that's not a pig, it's a sheep. The farmer yells, shut the f*** up, I was talking to the sheep. <laughs> <laughs> No, I like that, and and hey, the I don't know what the hell, uh, Jenny. You got to look at his audio there. That was kind of screwed. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Rubber balls and liquor. So these two desperately horny guys are on a deserted island. There's also a girl there, so it's two guys and a girl. They keep trying to come on to this girl. She keeps pushing them away. Finally, she gives up, and they're. Her over and over and over again in every conceivable position. One in the back, one in the front, then they switch around, they f her the other way. This is going on for months on end. After a year, the girl goes, I'm so ashamed of what I've been doing, wraps a rope around the tree and hangs herself. Five months later, the two guys are on the island there by themselves. One turns to the other and goes, I'm so ashamed of what we've been doing. And the other guy goes, yeah, me too. Maybe we should bury her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. You know, that was uh, something. Yes. Yeah. No. Nah. <laughs> that was... I don't know uh, what's wrong with his audio there, Jen, yes. but uh, we got to get him fixed here. Uh, and, and also, finally, Gilbert, uh, just before we get rolling here, i got to talk to you about uh, that, that controversy that was going on there uh, not so long ago. Yes. Uh, about you and the, the Aflac uh, commercial people. Yes. Uh, you, you lost the, the gig for the duck because of some jokes. Yes. And, <laughs> yeah. And uh, what what was the whole deal with that? Oh, yes. It was... It was um... To me, it was like, uh, well, first of all, the, the media was, well, the first people who blew it out of control was TMZ and Perez Hilton, and they were both right. shocked and offended because they're the arbiters of good taste. <laughs> Showbiz Tonight brought out, this is true, they brought out Camille Grammer, Kelsey's yeah. ex-wife, to say how shocked and offended she yeah. was. Oh. Absolutely true. And, yeah. and the media kept saying, and these insensitive comments and remarks... You know, you wouldn't call them jokes, because if you say jokes, people go, yeah, jokes. And then they go, I, well, they were jokes. A comedian said that. Well, that's what comedians do. But they were uh, they were kind of on the tasteless side. And But this was Gilbert Gottfried, right? Uh, has he ever said something tasteful? Hey, what, what is the actual news item here? Yeah, really. Uh, Jen, we got to figure that out. Gilbert, give me a laugh there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what the hell was going on? We're we're losing our stuff here. Right? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. So speaking of that uh, PreSonus digital mixer. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh well, there you go, and and there that is, and wow, that was absolutely a terrible waste of time. There you go. <laughs> Should have listened to fill up my mouth with farts again. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> well, moving on today, we do have to move on today. We we do have the stories, damn it, and that's what we're here for. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's just life, and I love doing it. I love doing these kind of stories anyway. Uh, yeah. Well, I, 
if you ever let me get to them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> yes, well, uh, President Obama team ramps up water regulations. Yes. Yes, it's very important and everything. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yes, in Washington today, the Obama administration moved today to expand anti-pollution regulations over smaller bodies of water, other executive actions that drew cheers from environmentalists and jeers from, well, Republicans. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, the Environmental Protection Agency, which already regulates large rivers and bays under the 1972 Clean Water Act, issued a rule asserting that authority over smaller rivers and wetlands. Uh, One in three Americans now gets their drinking water from streams lacking clear protection, and businesses and industries that depend on clean water face uncertainty and delay, which costs our economy every day, President Obama said in a statement today. Too many of our waters have been left in a vulnerable, uh, left vulnerable, sorry, to pollution. While environmentalists hailed the rule as a necessity for the cleanup of polluted waters, business groups described it as another executive overreach by the Obama presidency. Some said that they would look to Congress and the courts for redress. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you know what's good when you, you make a presidential statement and you're already getting threatened to be sued. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We're, we're, we're taking you down. Yes. <laughs> well, the National Federation of Independent Businesses said the new requirements mean higher permit fees and potential fees for their members. Yeah, look for your water bill to be going up soon. Yeah. <laughs> and that increased it would affect also puddles, ponds, and even stream beds that are dry most of the year. It's no surprise that the White House approved the massive expansion of federal authority over water, says Don Bosch the NFIB Senior Manager of Regulatory Policy. The process was rigged in favor of the agencies who simply decided that they didn't even need to consider the effects on small business, he said. In a statement, the NFIB said it would work through a legislative and possibly legal means to stop the new regulations. Well, Trip Van... Yes, thank you. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Trip Van Noppen, president of Earth Justice, said more than half the nation's rivers, streams, well, they're unfit for drinking or even swimming or fishing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, the U- uh, state of U.S. waters has worsened over the last decade. The Clean Water Act has been blunted by a decade of confusion and inaction, he said. The Environmental Protection Agency and U.S. Army Corps of Engineers have been holding a series of public meetings on the proposed rule, bracing both sides for Wednesday's announcement. The organization Environment America and the government's action closes legal loopholes and restores safeguards to small streams and headwaters that have been vulnerable to development and pollution for nearly a decade. Our rivers and lakes and drinking water can only be clean if the streams that flow into them are protected, says Margie Alt, executive director of Environment America. Damn, she's smart. <laughs> you, you just, you can't get better than that without university education. Yes. You, you just, <laughs> you, you just can't. You get, you got to know. Well, for years, the government has exercised anti-pollution regulations in large rivers, lakes, and bays pursuant to the 1972 Clean Water Act. McCarthy and other officials said that the new rule is designed to clear, clarify conflicting court rules on the government's power to regulate smaller streams, wetlands, and similar bodies of water. In a blog post, EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy, not to be confused with Jenny McCarthy, (laughs) (laughs) he said the new rule doesn't create any new permitting requirements for agriculture, maintains all previous exemptions and exclusions, and even adds exclusions for features like artificial lakes and ponds water-filled depressions from construction, and grass swells. All to make clear our goal is to stay out of agriculture's way. Monsanto. (laughs) (laughs) She means Monsanto. Yes. (laughs) Obama said the new rule will provide a clarity and certainty businesses and industry need about which waters are protected by the Clean Water Act, and it will ensure polluters who knowingly threaten our waters can be held accountable. All hail Monsanto. (laughs) (laughs) 
Yes, some congressional Republicans who have objected to previous Obama executive actions on items ranging from the environment to immigration are looking to counter the new water rule with legislation that would blunt it. Senator John Barrasso, a Republican of Wyoming and Monsanto shareholder. <laughs> <laughs> Who has said the new federal rule would hurt farmers? <laughs> <laughs> Ranchers. <laughs> and of course, private landowners. <laughs> Well, he's proposed a new Federal Water Quality Protection Act directing the EPA and Army Corps of Engineers to develop a Monsanto-friendly rule. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's possible to have reasonable regulations to help preserve our waterways while still allowing them to be used for Monsanto needs. <laughs> well, Senator Deb Fisher, also a Monsanto whore. <laughs> well, she, she calls the rule a, an attack on the people of Monsanto. <laughs> yes, it's an unprecedented overreach, she says, a federal control of water resources. The Obama administration's new regulation implies that Washington bureaucrats know better than the people of our state, Fisher said. This rule is reckless and unwarranted and will work tirelessly to stop this expansion of federal control over Monsanto. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all we got for Monsanto news. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> Moving on, of course, today we do have uh, some really big developments, of course, in the Hillary Clinton world. Yes. Yes, that's right. Judge orders a monthly release of Clinton emails. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and why, and why not? I mean, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually start the magazine. Yes, you know. <laughs> yeah, we'll call it uh, SMTP Clinton. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, well, a federal judge today has ordered the State Department to release emails from the private account of former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton in batches every 30 days until she withdraws from the presidency of the United States. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> judge says there's one sure way to destroy this woman and never let her into the White House, and this would be it. <laughs> Well, the State Department has offered to produce the emails every 60 days. But in order uh, that the last emails that will be released at the end of January, the Wednesday court order is in response to a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit filed by Jason Leopold of Vice News. Uh, yeah, no, they're not a Monsanto magazine. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, although Vice News, which sought the release of all Clinton's emails, along with other documents from her tenure as Secretary of State, you know, she screws up and has them on an insecure server. There's a big war about it, and then all of a sudden now we've all got to be made privy to every single one of them? Really? <laughs> they get f***ing crazy because all of a sudden nobody loves yeah. them. Yes. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Well, the State Department says there are about 55,000 pages of emails that Clinton turned over to the agency from her private account, which it needs to review before making public. Nearly 300 emails relate to the 2012 attack on the U.S. diplomatic post in Benghazi, Libya, that left four Americans dead, re was released actually last Friday. Clinton has been heavily criticized for conducting government business on a private email account, a practice that was discouraged by the Obama administration, but didn't frickin' stop him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, several Republican lawmakers, including Rep. Trey Gowdy, Republican, South Carolina, who chairs the House Committee investigating Benghazi, argue that because Clinton used a private, private email server, she could have removed any damaging emails before handing them over to the State Department. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, the department is keenly aware of this intense public interest. What, the five people in Iowa? Uh, <laughs> yeah, keenly, keenly aware. Yeah, so the documents and wants to uh, reassemble materials and get them out as soon as possible. 
The Justice Department lawyers representing state wrote in the department's uh, Tuesday proposal. Initially, the State Department proposed releasing all 55,000 pages of email over only after a corporate review had been conducted with a proposed release date of January 15, 2016. In that proposal, the agency laid out a procedure to review and, where necessary, redact the emails at a pace of roughly 1,000 per week. The order by U.S. District Judge Rudolph Contreras offers special targets for the percentage of total email pages that shall be released at each monthly deadline. In addition, the judge ordered, if any given month the department fails to meet the above-reference production goal, it shall explain in detail how it intends to catch up with the schedule by adding resources or otherwise. So this is going to be like a you know one of those weekly serial things. It's going to be like, well, not The Walking Dead, but... Uh... <laughs> this week on the Hillary emails. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. There we go. Well, hey, you know what? It's time. Yes, it is. Yes. It is time. We've got to take that uh, quick two-minute break for the commercials. And uh, don't worry, because when we come back... We've got some some more fun and games. It it just doesn't stop. You can't stop the funk. You, you just, <laughs> you, there there is no stop in this funk. Yes. Oh. So stick right there. Don't touch that dial. Wait, there's no more dial anymore. Yeah. Never mind. And uh, okay, don't touch your bloody computer then. There's, we'll be back in two. You've got it locked to HTLA Radio One, New York. What if there was a coffee that was sourced from some of the world's most renowned growing regions, abundant with rich, fertile soil? What if this coffee was picked at the perfect moment, then packed meticulously and shipped carefully to be roasted under the watchful eye of coffee masters? What if it was expertly blended, ground, and sealed, ensuring maximum flavor and freshness, then brewed in small batches, and always served fresh within 20 minutes, just the way you like it? Now, what if this coffee just happened to be the coffee you already know and love? Tim Hortons. Always fresh. Always great tasting coffee. Man, I've been to a lot of places over these past 50 years. Seen the whole true north strong and free. Cause I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere. I've been to Cooksville, Stowville, Bainesville, Bowmanville, Bonnyville, Unionville, Oakville, Dunville, Brockville, Boucherville, Melville, Drummondville, Kentville, Grenville, Morinville, Maryville, Parksville, Stephenville, Sackville, Spring Hill, Westville, Walkerville, hanging on a windowsill. Hey! He said, wow. That's a lot of places. I said, hang on, there's more. more. I've been to Moncton, Picton, Shannon, Vernon, Stellarton, Hamilton, Nipigon, Nobleton, Yorkton, Brighton, Bolton, Beaverton, Brandon, Edmonton, Walkerton, Wyerton, Grandy, Miramichi, Charlottetown, Burnaby, Yellow Knight, Whitehorse, Cornerbrook, none of it. I've been, I've been everywhere, everywhere, man. I've been everywhere, man. I cross the prairies, bear, man. I breathe the mountain air. I've traveled, I've done my share, man. I've been everywhere. Some said the U.S. has lost its innovative power. We said America is lighting the way as the innovation nation. Singular insights, superior execution. That's the power of global connections. Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Voted top global research firm 2011, 12, and 13. Hi, I'm Mike. Founder of DollarShaveClub.com. What is DollarShaveClub.com? Well, for a dollar a month, we send high-quality razors right to your door. Yeah, a dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great. Each razor has stainless steel blades and aloe vera lubricating strip and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand-name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. 
And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and ten blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Looking good, pop up! Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are gonna ship them right to you. We're not just selling razors, we're also making new jobs. Alejandro, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're gonna stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are dollarshaveclub.com and the party is on. I've been so inspired by being in New York because everything from what people are wearing on the street to the way they're interacting with each other to drive through the West Village at night and you see a couple kissing on the street or you see someone fighting outside their apartment or you see so much humanity on a daily basis that even if you're not inspired by your own life that day, you can be inspired by someone else's life. You got them long. There's only one place to get more Taylor. We're New York's best talk radio, HTLA Radio 1. We hugged in the elevator, and I still have an erection. <laughs> Now, I remember uh, sitting next to you on a plane. Yes. Yeah. And and I was flying out to L.A. to audition for some movie that I didn't get, which was fine. Yeah. Uh, because I, I remember I was reading the script, and you said to me, you said, oh, what are you reading? And I said... Oh, it's the, some John Travolta comedy. <laughs> <laughs> Called The Experts. Right, yeah. And, and uh, it's, uh, it's about two young hip Americans who get kidnapped by Russian spies to teach them how to act like young hip Americans. <laughs> and right. you... Uh, being a fortune teller, said, oh, that sounds like a piece, piece of shit. shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you, you always got to love the Travolta stuff. You yes. know, it's, <laughs> he, uh, he, he maybe could have acted once long, long ago, but... Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's not too bad, but, you know, uh, t George, uh, you know... It's one thing to talk about Travolta, <laughs> uh, and it's it's a really hard to do in a positive light. Yes, <laughs> but <laughs> but George, tell us about working with with the incredible Bill Shatner. How, how do you? He enjoys being the center of everything. Yeah, and uh, when he's on the set, uh, he dominates. Um, you may have heard about some of the uh, difficulties that. Uh, uh, Cast members have no, 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 no. We might be preparing a scene where uh, it'd be a close-up on you, right? And then it sh it would sh uh, ship to Bill, mm -hmm. and then you'd see Bill in a whispered conversation with the director, and the setup was changed, and it was on Bill, and you were the offstage voice. Yeah, that wouldn't happen on my freaking watch. Nope. <laughs> Be having some uh, words of my own with the director after that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, welcome back to the big show today. Hey, it is Coffee and Cigarettes, your Wednesday grinder. That's right. 
Boom! HTLA Radio 1, New York's best talk, where it is still. Actually, it's gone up a little bit. 81 degrees in Central Park right now. Sun's a-burning, and, uh, yeah, Gilbert's going to have a little rash on his tushy. (laughs) (laughs) You are... A douchebag. I know. Yes. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. But that's okay because that's that's just how we roll here, you know. I mean, it's about fucking time. Move on. Move yeah. on. <laughs> okay. Well, moving on. Of course, welcome back to the show. Uh, I'd like to welcome Shelly Nichols in the Spreaker dot com live chat right now. Yes, absolutely uh, amazing uh, that we we have the technology to have. You know, live people in live chats and doing live things. Yes. And, and <laughs> <laughs> it's all it's all live, you know. It's, they get f-ing crazy because all of a sudden nobody loves them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, don't worry, Shelley. We love you here at HTLA, and, and we're glad you could join us here today. Break for a commercial. Yeah. Yeah. That's. <laughs> That's what we'll do. No, actually, Gilbert, we have to move on, of course. We we have uh, stories to cover. Uh, you know? It's just life, and I love doing it. I love doing these kind of stories anyway. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the Quartet Middle East envoy, Tony Blair, yes, former prime minister, uh, Tony Blair, today has stepped down as the international community's Mideast envoy, officials said, leaving a post that began with a great promise, but which struggled to deliver dramatic changes in its quest to promote peace between Israel and the Palestinians. He was quoted as saying, F it, I'm out of here. <laughs> well, the departure reflected the dire state of Middle East peace efforts right now, which have been stalled for years and show no signs of resuming following the formation of Israeli Prime Minister's Benjamin Netanyahu's new government. A top Palestinian official said that he was, quote, happy, Blair was leaving. (laughs) (laughs) Accusing him of absolute, total, and utter ineffectiveness, old chap. (laughs) Ineffectiveness and, of course, caving to Israeli pressures. Yes. Now... Well, officials familiar with the work of the quartet in the region said Blair had written a letter to the United Nations. Oh, we don't know how those go. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Those are are some some top quality letters there. Yes. That's why power is corrupt, and it is. We Mm -hmm. see it every day. We see it in every job. It's the same thing. Oh, I know. I know. (laughs) Well, uh, officials were familiar with the work of the quartet in the region, said Blair had written a letter to the United Nations chief, Ben Ki-moon, to confirm his resignation. The officials spoke uh, on condition of anonymity pending a formal announcement, which was expected later today at a meeting of quartet officials in Brussels. U.S. spokesman Stephanie de Jurek, well, that would be a spokesperson. Yes. <laughs> or, or dare I say, a spokeswoman. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, said that he, he, she could not yet confirm the resignation letter. The quartet, which includes the U.S. and European Union, Russian, and the United Nations, appointed Blair to the post in 2007 with the goal of helping develop Palestinian economy and institutions. The mission was meant to prepare the groundwork for the establishment of a Palestinian state alongside Israel as part of a peace agreement. In the addition of the high profile, Blair gave the office star power and raised hopes for progress. Yes, you know, when I think global stars, I think, well, to be fair, first the Rolling Stones. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, most definitely second, uh, I don't know, that new little princess baby. In the- <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, there's a couple of other people. Yes. But uh, I think, you know, down the list around 584 is Tony Blair. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, when Blair first took the office, the Israeli Prime Minister then, Ehud Olmert, and Abbas were conducting a round of peace talks, and both sides have made significant progress. But those talks ultimately failed, and since Netanyahu's election in 2009, repeated attempts at reviving talks have absolutely flopped. Netanyahu's new government is dominated by, well, parliamentary hardliners who oppose Palestinian independence full stop. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Maybe it's that uh, love hate. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I, I. I. Well, I'm. I'm sure there's the second bit yeah. there. Yeah. 
Well, according to Blair's office's website, Blair uh, office has succeeded in helping remove dozens of Israeli checkpoints in the West Bank, easing the movement of workers and Palestinian products to market. He also helped boost tourism in the West Bank, town of Bethlehem, helped secure thousands of permits for Palestinian laborers to work in Israel, helped engineer a $350 million mobile phone investment in the West Bank, creating thousands of jobs, and also pressed Israel to allow limited exports out of blocked Gaza. Oh, yeah. Well, good riddance. See you later, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> well, get this. Blair's part-time position was unpaid. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, as he coupled the job with a lucrative private sector career, the Palestinians often complained that he was ineffective and caved into Israeli demands too easily. Quote, I'm happy that Tony Blair is leaving for the uh, entire eight years. Tony Blair didn't make any contribution to Palestine. Really? Read above, shitbag. There you go. <laughs> Well, Netanyahu's office, of course, declined to comment on the filthy Palestinian pigs. <laughs> well, the official said that Blair's resignation would go into effect in June, but that he hopes to play the informal role in uh, promoting the quartet's vision of a two-state solution. Yes, one area where he could help this is developing relations between Israel and the wider Arab world, the official said. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, so things aren't going so great over there, so I guess we can uh, kind of not expect even uh, anywhere. Well, I, I shouldn't even be talking about an Iran deal, should I? No. <laughs> well, if Tony Blair is sucking over there, then you know anybody we're sending is doing worse. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Penn State frat news. That's always fun, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is. Penn State University today has revoked a recognition of the Kappa Delta Rho fraternity on campus for three years for alleged patterns of sexual harassment, including posting nude photos of unconscious women on Facebook. We brought you this story about uh, four or five months ago. Yes. <laughs> Yes, and of course, then I was very embittered that I, I had not received from them the link to the Facebook page. <laughs> I, I still I still don't have my link to the Facebook yes. page. Uh, please, any of you Kappa Delta Rose out there, uh, send it to me. Producer at HTLA Radio 1. <laughs> Well, the university said some KDR members regularly posted embarrassing photos of women, including using demeaning language to describe females and cultivated a persistent climate of humiliation for several females, according to a press release issued yesterday by Penn State News. Among other duties, KDR pledges we are required to create stories with pornographic images and a sex position of the day, the statement said. There you go. <laughs> Uh, we should do that on coffee and cigarettes. The sexual position of the day as demonstrated by topless Jenny. Yes. 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 <laughs> At least we get more than three listeners. Yeah. <laughs> well, the punishment was spelled out by Damon Sims, vice president for student affairs, to the student-led Infraternity Council, the IFC, of course the governing body for fraternities at Penn State. His ruling reversed an IFC recommendation that disciplinary action would have to be included with new member education and sexual assault by the bystander intervention training, but no withdrawal of recognition. The decision was upheld by University President Eric Barron today and independently... Um, no, never mind. Ignore what I said. <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah. In his letter to IFC, Sims said that while not every member of the fraternity was equally culpable, the sum of the organizational misbehaviors is far more than the university can tolerate from a student organization that seeks its... Yeah, stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's... Seeks its stuff there. I, I don't know. These guys should just go into business. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just start up the pay porn picture site, and <laughs> you can uh, you can go to any other college in the country. You'll have the money. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, in March, local police discovered two private Facebook pages allegedly run by KDR members that included photos of nude, unconscious women, as well as evidence of drugs sales and hazing. Yes. 
Sims also highlighted the persistent harassment of two female students in particular who were, quote, really hot. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, and they were degraded through multiple postings of the organization's uh, private site over an extended period of time. They were the frat's feature girls. (laughs) (laughs) Well, in anticipation of the report, Kappa Delta Rho's national office issued a statement saying that it is its national leadership investigated the matter internally, like they always say. Yes. (laughs) And, of course, any member found to have committed any improprieties will be disciplined up to and including expulsion. But we'll never tell you who. (laughs) <laughs> uh, it's gonna, it's going to go the way of the Hillary emails, you know yes. that, right? Yeah. yeah. Well. <clears throat> oh yeah. Oh, okay. That's good. She's Jenny's saying it's time for a commercial. I'm like, yeah, screw you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to go to a commercial until I tell you about this story, which. Well, it, it it almost upsets me more than not getting the link to the uh, Porno Frats website. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, this, this one's, this one's uh, yeah. <clears throat> well, I guess thanks to feminists. Yes. Yes. Uh, man Choir. Yes, in, in our high schools now, it's, it's, it's more fun than football. <laughs> yeah, yeah, apparently... Well, I guess also thanks to, uh, you know, homosexuals there, George. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure the, uh, the gay folk there uh, went a long way to uh, you know, stopping football programs and giving us choirs. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, in Oak Harbor, Washington, take a bunch of high school guys, put them in a room with a piano and a teacher and a bit of uh, boot camp, and before you know it, they're making beautiful music. Thank God we don't have to listen to it. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, gang. It's choir class at Oak Harbor High School, but not just any choir. This is a man choir. Yes. <laughs> yes, when you say man choir to them, they grunt, said teacher Darren McCoy, who started the class three years ago as a way to get more homosexual boys into being men. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, no, it was actually to get boys interested in singing, of yes. course. But, well, at first there was just a brave few. Now there are dozens. The first day was hilarious because they walked in here like, oh, my God, I have no idea what I'm doing in here, he said. <laughs> well, among the voices is Alex Tucker, a big, burly, bearded football player. He's a guy who looks like he'd be more comfortable reading uh, opposing defenses than lines of music. The guys made fun of me at first, but after I killed them... <laughs> <laughs> because my testosterone is being repressed. Yes. <laughs> and my lawyer got me off because they killed my testosterone. <laughs> yes, he's he's now he's now okay with the ridiculing he still gets. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, good old McCoy there is up for a National Teacher Award, which is what's making this national news. Yes. <laughs> yes, due in part, of course, to his work with Man Choir. He says that the key to getting guys excited about singing is naked women. <laughs> oh, no, sorry, I misread that. He actually says it's making it active. Yeah. There we go. All right. Girls like to sit there with their heads uh, behind their backs and sing pretty notes. Boys have to move, he said. I'm going to read that again because it didn't make any sense. <laughs> Girls like to sit there with their he- heads behind their backs and sing pretty... Oh, I'm just going to leave this. Yes. I mean, what? <laughs> well, the other key is giving boys songs that they can relate to. That's right. They sing fight songs, battle hymns, and the occasional... Yes, this will get them going. Love songs. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Come on, boys. Get off the 50-yard line. It's time for Barry Mandelow. <laughs> uh, well, in the end, Man Choir might be the manliest thing at Oak Harbor High. That's because Man Choir teaches the young men to step out of their comfort zones, 
prove doubters wrong and be who they truly truly are. Beta males. <laughs> <laughs> Just ask, just ask Alex Tucker. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Alex says, choir is more fun than football, he confides. I'm not ashamed to say it. One, two. <laughs> and what could be more manly than that? Yes. Was. <laughs> wow. Well, there it is. Uh, the man choir uh, probably coming soon to a high school near you because sure as shooting, the PCers are going to want this. Everywhere. <laughs> uh, I wonder if they're tied in with Monsanto. <laughs> well, we're going to go for that commercial break now. Finally, yes. I'll, I'll go ahead and, and, and listen to the whip that she's uh, cracking over there. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> and we'll go for that commercial break, but don't go anywhere because, well, you don't have a dial to turn, so. <laughs> You're kind of screwed. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, the, uh, when we come back, though, we've got uh, Islamic State news uh, talking about some suicide attacks that have been going on yesterday and today, hindering uh, Iraq's Anbar push, that uh, strategic thing we were telling you about there the other day that made no sense to anybody. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so stick around. We'll be back in two. You've got it locked to New York's best talk, HTLA Radio 1. Hi, I'm Mike, founder of DollarShaveClub.com. What is DollarShaveClub.com? Well, for a dollar a month, we send high-quality razors right to your door. Yeah, a dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great. Each razor has stainless steel blades and aloe vera lubricating strip and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher and 10 blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Looking good, pop up! Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are gonna ship them right to you. We're not just selling razors, we're also making new jobs. Alejandro, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're gonna stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are DollarShaveClub.com, and the party is on. It could be 7 in the morning. Or 10 at night. In Chilliwack, B.C. Or St. Peter's, Nova Scotia. It could be Michelle. Or Mark. Or Jen. But whenever. Wherever you order that cup of Tim Hortons premium blend coffee, you know that it's always. 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 Fresh. From Newfoundland and Labrador to Vancouver Island, Tim Hortons, a coffee all our own. When we arrived at our hotel in New York, the porter was so incredibly careful careless with, with our bags. bags. And, and the room they gave us, it was, it was beautiful. A broom closet. But the, but the best part worst part was the shower. shower. My, My wife drying herself with the Egyptian cotton towels. Shower curtain defined, defined that whole vacation, whole vacation for, her. for her. Don't just visit New York. Visit TripAdvisor New York. With millions of reviews, a visit to TripAdvisor makes any destination better. Some said the U.S. has lost its innovative power. We said America is lighting the way as the innovation nation. Singular insights, superior execution. That's the power of global connections. Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Voted top global research firm, 2011, 12, and 13. We're 
Network's Best Talk Radio, HTLA Radio 1. The boys around me were uh, saying things like, um, Sally is cute, or Monica is hot. <laughs> yeah. I thought... Sally and Monica. You are nice, a douchebag. He and Who really got me excited was Bobby. What, what particularly was exciting was he had blonde uh, forearm hair mm-hmm. and he was tan. Yeah. Like, listen, that's when uh, what uh, caught my eye when I first saw it. Oh, yeah. Uh, he had his t shirt on, but you can see that he had great pictures. Oh, yeah. And then to see it on. And. <sighs> yeah. Oh, George. <laughs> Thank you, George. <laughs> Only the tip of the iceberg. I sure as hell wish it was. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to the big show. Of course, today your coffee and cigarettes Wednesday grinder for the 27th of May, 2015. 81 degrees, still in Central Park. God damn it, why aren't I out there? <laughs> <laughs> well, because I'm in here talking Monsanto. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, I'm 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 really uh, I'm really kind of uh, well. I, I guess I've been on enough radio shows <laughs> to know that in the middle of an answer, the guy is like checking the boards no, and I'm... looking over notes and well, talking right. to other people. Yes, <laughs> see, now yeah, you're impressed. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Yes, no, <laughs> <laughs> no. See. See Gilbert, you're sitting in your uh, apartment. Yes. You, you're 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 by yourself. You're... <laughs> <laughs> we, we we wouldn't actually have you come down here. Yeah. No. You know, I'm the most talented guy in this room. That much I'll give you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, there you go. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the big show today, the Coffee and Cigarettes Wednesday Grinder, helping you get through your hump day. And hey, this is, of course, as always, brought to you by the fine folks at Tim Hortons, New York City, now with eight fine locations in that city to serve all of your coffee and baked goods needs. Get on down there, tell them I sent you, and if you get fat, don't blame me. It's not... <laughs> No, well, actually, I, I've got to be honest. I don't even touch uh, any of their baked goods. It's, yes. No, it, 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 it's, it's, it's not that their baked goods aren't stellar and incredible. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, kind of contrary. I, I would be 600 pounds if I did <laughs> to get into any of that. So, yeah, we, we don't want to go there. Moving on this afternoon, of course, though, we do have some, uh, well, I guess, yeah, we'll call it the, uh, the, the, the is, is news. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Is, is, ISIS, yes, ISIS. Uh, the Islamic State, those suicide attacks now are hindering Iraq's Anbar push. Of course, last week we told you about uh, Iraq's operation to recapture areas under the control of the Islamic State extremist. Well, they've faced a setback today as the group unleashed a wave of suicide attacks targeting the Iraqi army in western Anbar province. At least 17 troops have been killed. Brigadier General Saad Man Ibrahim, an Iraqi army spokesman, told the Associated Press that the attacks happened near the Islamic State-held city of Fallujah. He said it was unclear how many Islamic State fighters were involved. The attacks came just hours after the Iraqi government on Tuesday said it would start a campaign to retake parts of Anbar from the Islamic State, also known as ISIL or ISIS. Earlier this month, the militants recaptured Ramadi in Iraq and the ancient Syrian town of Palmyra. In the intervening period, the United States and Iraq have publicly quarreled over the respective roles in the ongoing conflict. And, uh, yeah, so things are not looking too much better there. In fact, it's all gone to hell. Yeah. <laughs> so. It's it's done. It's, yes. it's, it's, it's just just let them keep on for another four thousand years. Just, <laughs> just, um, we don't need to to deal with that. We've got enough things to to take care of at home here. But as an addendum to this story, the monks won't leave the ancient monastery amid the ISIL threat. That's right. In Al Faf, Iraq, Yusuf Ibrahim paces down the 1,600-year-old chamber room of St. Matthew's Monastery, passing rows of empty polished wood pews 
ornate crystal chandeliers hang from the arched ceiling above him. The room smells of dust and incense, and its silence is peaceful. Outside of the ancient walls, however, the battle for Iraq is, of course, raging. We can see the battles and the airstrikes from here in the front of uh, us, especially at night. The sky lights up, but of course we're not scared. God protects us, Ibrahim said. <laughs> yes, God will. God will indeed protect you. You have. Yes. You have no fear. Just you, you don't even have to fear. Just all praise, Monsanto. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, well, situated on the side of Mount Al-Faf in North Iraq's Niva Plains, the St. Matthew's Monastery is recognized as one of the oldest Christian monasteries in Iraq. Today, the beige stone structure looks down on the rolling hills of one of Iraq's most active front lines against the Islamic State, less than four miles away. The horizon is spotted with uh, plumbing towers of white and black smoke from U.S.-led coalition airstrikes and heavy artillery fire. From this front line, Islamic State territory stretches back to Mosul, the group's largest Iraqi stronghold. The proximity of the Islamic State to St. Matthew's means the monastery is constantly at risk. The extremist group is, of course, known for destroying churches, museums, and other cultural and historical significant sites. Last week, the militants seized the Syrian city of Palmyra and its ruins, described by the United Nations as, quote, one of the most important cultural centers of the ancient world. The city's fall left the world holding its breath in anticipation of the UNESCO World Heritage Site's destruction. And, and yes, there, I remember uh, here in New York City, we, we held uh, a four million person candlelight vigil uh, for the, the ruins there because they're so damned important to us. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that. It was uh, good. You should have been there. Yes. Well, St. Matthew's is safely under Kurdish Pashmira military control for now, but Sadir Karikos, one of the six students of the, at the monastery, fears what could, would happen if the Islamic State advances closer. We're not scared because our teachers give us a feeling of peace here, but we know we are on the front lines, and in seconds the Islamic ex, it, I'm just going to say is, is. <laughs> <laughs> In in just seconds, is is could be here. Yes, yes. To speak about the destruction the Islamic State would cause if they took our monastery. While monks at the monastery say they're confident God and the Peshmagira forces will protect the site, they have removed most of their precious relics, including century-old Christian manuscripts from the tomb of monastery's namesake, St. Matthew, now lies empty. The bones have been moved north to the relatively safe territory of the Kurdish regional government which, of course, will be ISIS's next target. <laughs> well, most of the residents from the villages below the monastery, including Kariko's family, also sought refuge in that region after fleeing in August when the Islamic State advanced on the area. The three monks at the monastery and all six students, however, resolved to stay. From the monastery's stone terraces, Kariko's can see the village, Bartala, a Christian town that dates back more than 1,000 years. Today, as he points out his abandoned village from the high on the mountainside, thick plumes of smoke billow up from Baltala, or Bartala's skyline. The Islamic State does not understand what history means. They just understand the breaking of history, he says. If a people don't have the history of their past, then they will not have the future because they will not know what their origins are or where they come from. That's why we in North America have education. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, in its heyday, the monastery boasted 7,000 monks. Wow, really? I'm a... <laughs> well, what is this, like a, a, a tour of the monastery? Yes. Well, what the hell are we doing here? <laughs> well, you see, Jenny's supposed to edit these bloody stories. Yes. And, you know, always we're finding, oh, well, here's 27 more paragraphs of useless info crash. Go for it. <laughs> Oh, man, I'm going to have to get her something. Yes. I don't know what the hell. Well, gang, that is all we got for today. We're a little bit over time, so, yeah, they can sue me. <laughs> I want to thank the one, the only, Louis Lawless for being here uh, today and, and enjoying the show with us and, and not really saying much. Which which uh, woman are you married to or living with now? The same one? The, what, the, the mother of the daughter or the... 
Was it a boy? I'm I'm transgender, Louie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I I sleep with it all. I just. <laughs> just <laughs> I just give it up. Uh, Gilbert, thank you for being here on the show today. I really appreciate it, man. Thank you for listening and support the show for the love of God. God. Right. <laughs> uh, actually, what you meant to say was the love of Monsanto. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Also, George Takei, thank you for being here again. I've thank enjoyed you. it thoroughly. It has been a fantastic experience. Well, thank you, and, and it's uh, it's great to have you as always. Thank you. I think it's a treat to be here talking with you. Okay, quit sucking up. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's not a lot of work for an old gay Japanese man. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and a big thank you to all our listeners out there on all the millions of bloody platforms we've got all over the continental planet Earth. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. And, hey, I hope this made your hump day a little bit better. And uh, if not, well, just try again tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean that, though. Try again tomorrow because, you know, we've got the uh, Thursday double-double coming up there. Yes. And uh, that's going to be sure to be so much better than this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? My film, Un- Unrepented, did very well in Europe. Yeah, nobody cares, Louie. No. No. <laughs> you know how to spell my last name on the check, right? It's Louis Lawless. Yeah, it's in the mail. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. We'll see you tomorrow here on the Thursday Double Double.